Hey guys, it's Graham. What's cracking? As promised, this is my video about the uh, the Aragon series. Well, it's called Inheritance, but the series started with the book Aragon in 2005 and concluded with uh, the book Inheritance in 2011. But this year, in 2023, uh, Christopher Paolini is releasing a fifth book in the series focused on a side character named Murtog, who, for my money, is a much more interesting character. Not that you know Aragon was an uninteresting protagonist, but uh, Murtog was kind of like the, the darker version of Aragon, an, an unwilling accomplice with the evil emperor, king, villain, bad guy of the main series, who you know once he got his mind freed, he was able to go about and, and do his own thing. He kind of had a, a tragic exit, but with a hopeful future, we'll say, once the series concluded. And the plot of this fifth book is that, you know, now that he and his dragon are kind of outcasts for the role that they played, even unwillingly, in the subjugation of the people and carrying out the evil king's will, they're on a path for redemption. You know, they, they want to get in the good graces of people. They want to do good things, despite, you know, the fact that what they did during the course of the original series wasn't really within their will. You know, Murtog and Thorn, his dragon's name, still, you know, you, you want to make up for what was done by your hand. So I assume that's what the fifth book is about. The description on Amazon says that, uh, uh, you know, there's a power vacuum whenever a villain is defeated. In this case, a, an evil witch is rising up and causing trouble and Murtaugh and Thorne are gonna saddle up and check it out. But since it's been 12 years since a book came out in this series, I decided we're gonna go through the Wikipedia summaries of the plots of the, the four books leading up to this, just so you can remember what the world was like and what the events were leading up to you know, its, its conclusion of that, of that main cycle. I will say that if you're trying to wrap your head around what's going on in the first book, it helps if you think of it as Dragon Star Wars, because Star Wars A New Hope is basically the plot of that first book. And in 2006, when I read it, I just remember really enjoying the book. I didn't make that connection between Aragon and Star Wars until a friend pointed it out, a friend who was critical of the series and didn't care for it. She didn't have as much fun with it as I did. But once she pointed that out, I was like, well, shoot, you're right. You know, the, the beats are there. He's an orphan farm boy living with his uncle and, uh, you know, bad guys show up. His uncle dies. Um, the local old guy, hobo, who knows the ways of the force or magic or whatever, takes him on a, on a journey, explains to him some things, dies along the way, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm getting ahead of myself. You see where the, the beats are that uh, fit the comparison of Star Wars. We'll start off with book one, Aragon. Um, there's a bit of a prologue to it. There's a shade named Dorza. I'm gonna have my own little asides here to kind of explain things. If I remember right, because it's been a few years since I read this myself, uh, Paolini gave very rigid definitions to things like magician, sorcerer, wizard, shade. Like these weren't just um, words for the same thing. You know, the, these had defined characteristics. Like this one uses spirits, this one uses words, this one uses potions or whatever. You know, so a shade was something in particular. Not quite living, not quite dead. Uh, a shade named Durza, along with a group of Urgles, it's kind of Paolini's versions of orcs, but there's, there's some distinctions. They ambush a party of three elves, they kill two of them, and Durza attempts to steal an egg carried by the remaining female elf. However, she manages to use magic to teleport it elsewhere. Infuriated, Durza abducts her and keeps her prisoner at the city of Gilead. There was the movie that came out in 2006, and uh, you know, for the most part it followed these story beats. It did have to condense a lot. But the visuals in the movie, you know, line up with a lot of stuff that, uh, that happens here in, in this summary. Sienna Guillory played the female elf. I think Robert Carlyle played the shade. Um, the lead role went to Ed Spilliers, who I never watched Downton Abbey, but I think he was on Downton Abbey. And then most recently he was on season three of Star Trek Picard. He plays Captain Picard's son. So um, he's good. He's got good chops. I just don't think that he's like taken hugely big cinematic roles or anything, but whenever I've seen him pop up in something, he's good. And uh, he did well enough in this one. You know, there's the whole like, you, you can act as well as the, the script that you're given and you know, they were condensing a lot into a, a, an hour and 40 minute movie. Anyway, the spell that the 
elf chick cast it, it through the, the stone, the egg, the whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, when Aragon finds it, he thinks it's a stone, drops it somewhere in the middle of the forest and it lands near Aragon, who's a 15 year old village boy out hunting in the woods. Doesn't know what to make of the stone, but it looks nice, looks precious. It's about yay big, it's blue, it's got weird coloring. Takes it back to his village and uh, soon discovers that it's an egg and it hatches and a little baby dragon comes out. Um, when he touches the dragon, it leaves a silver mark on his hand. Aragon names the dragon Saphira after a name the old village storyteller Brom mentions. Brom is the Obi-Wan Kenobi character. Aragon raises the dragon in secret until two of King Galbatorix's servants, the Razak, come to Carvajal. Aragon and Saphira escape and hide in the spine, that's the mountain range. Um, ba -bum 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 -bum. But Garo is fatally wounded and the farm is burned down by the Razak. Garo is Uncle Owen. Once Garo dies, Aragon and Saphira decide to hunt the Razak in vengeance. Brahm insists on accompanying him and Saphira and gives Aragon the sword Zarak. I will pause here and say that uh, I feel like Pauli needed a lot of research into technical things. Like uh, there's a chapter on saddle making. Uh, he does other other things as far as like how to hide Saphira while she's growing. You know the things that she eats. Like you know he focuses on the minutia, but it doesn't drag out too long. It's just you know showing the the practical side of you know how you would raise an animal like this and then like once it grows to a certain size how you would take care of it it's a little bit more protracted than it is in that in that aragon movie but uh, it, i think it works it, it's pretty cool aragon becomes a capital d capital r dragon rider uh, through his bond with Saphira. he is the only known rider in Alagasia other than king galbatorix who with the help of the now dead forsworn a group of rogue riders killed every other rider a century ago so Galbatorix is really old, but he's got magic. He's got the, the rider magic, which like sorcerer, like shade, like whatever is its own thing. Uh, but he's in charge. Um, as they travel, Brom teaches Aragon sword fighting, magic, the ancient elvish language and the ways of the dragon riders. The language is important because that's how magic works in this series. Uh, if, if you speak the elvish language, like that's the original magical language for everything. Like uh, it's, it's all the power that is in that thing is also attached to the word. So, you know, if you use the elvish word for fire, you can conjure fire. Like that's, that's why it's important. Uh, they travel to the city of Tyrim where they meet with Brahm's friend, Jode. Aragorn's fortune is told by the witch Angela and her companion, the werecat Solombum. She, they, they give Aragorn mysterious advice. With Jode's help, they track the Razak to the city of Dras Leona. You're going to come up with a lot of new proper nouns in this story. They manage to infiltrate the city, but they are forced to flee after a run-in with the Razak. That night, they are ambushed by the Razak. A stranger named Murtog rescues them. This is his introduction to the story. But Brom is mortally wounded. Brom gives Aragon his blessing, reveals that he was once a dragon rider, and that his dragon was also named Saphira. Saphira uses magic to encase Brom in a diamond tomb. This is where we divert a little bit from the Star Wars model. Murtog isn't exactly Han Solo, but uh, we'll, we'll say that he's kind of the rogue character here. He's the same age as Aragon. He doesn't have a, a Wookiee or a Millennium Falcon or anything, but he's got his own reasons for continuing on in this quest with, uh, with Aragon. Murtog becomes Aragon's new companion. They travel to the city of Gilead, seeking information on how to find the Varden, that's the rebellion. Uh, near Gilead, Aragon is captured and imprisoned in a jail that holds a female elf that he has had recurring dreams about. Murtog and Saphira stage a rescue, and Aragon takes the unconscious elf with him. After fighting Durza, Murtog seemingly kills him with an arrow to the head. Aragon telepathically communicates with the elf. That's something he can do now that he's got dragon magic. Her name is Arya. She reveals that she was the one that teleported the egg to him. She did so accidentally. From her, he learns the location of the rebel base. It's in a mountain somewhere. Murtog is reluctant to go with Aragon because it um, turns out that his father was a guy named Morzan, who was one of those bad renegade riders that uh, killed everybody a century ago. So not, not going to be all that welcome there. 
an army of elite Urgals chases Aragon to the Varden's headquarters, but uh, the Varden drive them off. Then they escort Aragon, Sephira, Murtog, and Arya to the mountain hideout. Aragon meets the leader of the Varden, Ajihad, who imprisons Murtog and ref uh, after he refuses to allow his mind to be read. They've also got magic and stuff, but Murtog doesn't want anybody knowing who he is, who he's re related to. Uh, Aragon is told by Ajihad that Murtog failed to kill Durza because even though you shoot him in the head, he's a shade. You got to shoot him in the heart. Um, Aragon meets Oric, nephew of the dwarf, dwarf king Hrothgar. Um, this is where you'll see the Beowulf influences come into the story because Hrothgar was also a, a king in, in that story. Um, the Varden are they, they consist of humans and dwarves. They have... Uh, some elvish alliances, but the elves are, are elsewhere. Um, Auric is Aragon and Saphira's guide. This character was completely removed from the movie. Aragon also meets Ajahad's daughter, Nasuwata, and Ajahad's right-hand man, Jormander. I barely remember these characters. Um, Nasuwata was in the movie, but uh, she has a much bigger role in the books. Uh, he also runs into Angela and Solombaum, so like the witch and the cat, they just pop up there too. They're like, hey, remember us? Yeah, well, we're here. Uh, he's tested by two magicians that are simply named the Twins, and uh, then Aragon and the Varden are attacked by an immense Urgal army. Now, I will say in the movie, like, you could tell they were kind of saving some money on special effects here because the Urgals were just, like, big dudes with shaved heads and weird face paint. But in the books, they were, they were bigger, taller. They had, like, ram horns. They were vicious monster-looking things. Um, bum, 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 bum. Aragon personally battles Durza again after a mental battle. He's overwhelmed by Durza, who slashes him across the back, leaves him with a bad wound. Um, Arya rides in on Saphira, and while the shade is distracted, Aragon stabs him through the heart with his special sword, Zarok. He falls into a coma, and then he's visited telepathically by a stranger who tells Aragon to go visit him in the elven capital of Elismera. He wakes up with a scar across his back and resolves to journey to Elismira. That's the end of the first book. Um, quick thoughts that I had after that. Uh, there were a few moments that I remember in the book that like, I feel like he went on and on too much about like physical descriptions of the place, but you could tell that he'd really liked thought these things out, mapped them out in his head. And uh, you know, he was excited to put them together, put them into print, like Farthen Dur, the, the mountain where the Varden live. Um, it was like the inside of a hollowed out volcano and there was like two pages straight of just descriptions of this place. Um, since he was heavily inspired by Tolkien, he also kind of went the Tolkien-esque route of making up his own language. There, was, there were two languages, like the Elvish ma magic language and then like the Dwarven language. One of them was based on uh, a Scandinavian tongue and the other one was one that he just made up completely on his own. So, um, you know, pretty pretty heavy lifting as far as world building goes, uh, you know, for, for somebody doing that at such a, a young age and having it be consistent and entertaining, um, kind of like lit RPG and like super big high epic fantasy. It's one of those things where like I personally kind of get lost in the details of all that stuff and just sort of push through it. But there are other people that like digesting big books like that with, with that kind of content at a slow pace. But uh, I found the action of it all to be very exciting and uh, you know, I, I wanted to see what happens next. So that was a summary of Aragon. Let's take a quick break and then we'll get into book two, Eldest. We pick up almost exactly where we left off when Eldest starts. Um, Ajihad, the king of the Varden, is ambushed and killed while Murtog and the twins are assumed dead. There's another quick battle at the beginning. Murtog, I remember, like, falls down this deep, dark chasm. Uh, I can't remember what happened to the twins. They show up later. Spoiler alert, they're evil. Uh, Ajihad's daughter, Naswata, is elected to command the Varden and decides to move them to Sorda and oppose the Empire openly. Aragon and Saphira decide to travel to the forest Duveldin Varden to be trained as a dragon rider by the elves. Um, he's hopping in his X-Wing and going to Dagobah. Think of it that way. The dwarf king, Hrothgar, adopts Aragon to his clan and as has his now foster brother, Auric, accompany him to the forest. So little not Gimli is going with Aragon to Dagobah. There, Aragon meets the stranger who had contacted him at the end of the last book, revealed to be a rider named Oramus and his dragon, Glader, the only dragon and rider secretly alive. So quick retcon from the previous book. There is another dragon and another rider. However, they are both uh, crippled. 
I remember Glader is like missing a hand and, and Ormus has something else, or missing a, a claw and Ormus has something else going on. Uh, they're both crippled. They can't fight Galvatorix directly, but uh, dragons still have like that inert or innate um, internal magic. They're, they're very powerful sources of it. And so, you know, they still have magic and they still have a whole wealth of knowledge. They just don't have combat prowess. Um, they choose to pass on their knowledge. Aragon and Saphira are taught the use of logic, magic theory, scholarship, and combat, among other things. So a huge portion of the second book is uh, occupied with Aragon's lessons with Oremus. But I think it fleshes out the world building really interesting, and it it, uh, it did make for good reading, even though it, it kind of slowed down there. It was it was fascinating to see like how this all worked and kind of get an idea of what he was going to do going forward. Since Aragorn received a back injury in the previous book, he's beset by agonizing seizures, which debilitate him. He also struggles with his romantic feelings for Arya, while Saphira has similar struggles toward Glader. Um, Arya, I think, is like, even though she looks kind of normally aged, like she's 100 years old because she's an elf and Aragorn's still only like 15, 16. Uh, I think when they did the movie, they did a good job of casting two actors that, you know, he was like 20 and she was 30 or something, just to kind of show like, okay, like here's this young man and here's this, um, you know, somewhat relatively young woman, but she's still older than him. And you, know, you can see why he would be attracted to her. She's kind of his gateway to this whole world and she's also very beautiful, but she rebuffs him, you know, out of a very practical sense. She's like, yeah, no, but you know, when you're 15, 16, you struggle with those emotions. You can't just turn them off. It sucks. Uh, Arya becomes aware of his feelings and distances herself from him not to interfere in his education while Saphira is violently rejected by Glader. Dragons don't mess around. Eventually, in an ancient elven ceremony called the Agatei Blodren, lots of magical words in this, Aragorn is affected by powerful magic, turning him into an elf-human hybrid and healing his back injury. I still remember this scene from the book because it was very, very cool. It's this thing that can only happen like every hundred years and uh, like this, you know, magic comes up out of the ground or whatever. But there are these two elf chicks that, uh, that did this dance and between the two of them, they had a complete dragon like tattooed across their body. Like the tail started at one heel and then like it went uh, across like her tor torso and then like the other twin elf chicks, like the, the dragon continued on hers and there was wings and stuff and they, they'd do this synchronized dance and it would look like the dragon was moving and as it was coming to life, like the magic would get stronger and stronger until like the dragon tattoo lifted off of them and like flows into Aragorn and it heals his injury and stuff like, okay, cool. There was some debate about whether Aragorn should be the recipient of that or whether Oramis should, if you know, him and Glader would get healed and, you know, they, Aragorn's got that protagonist energy. So, you know, he got the, uh, the healing power from that, but I thought that was a really, really cool scene. Uh, Aragorn is affected by powerful magic, blah, blah, blah. I already read that. He makes another romantic attempt on Arya. He's like, Hey, I'm half elf now. You want to give this another shot? She's like, no. Anyway, bye. She leaves to rejoin the Varden. Meanwhile, unknowing of all of this, Aragorn's cousin, Rorin, forgot to mention him in the, in the previous summary, but yeah, uh, he leaves because he doesn't want to get drafted by Galvatorix's army that, you know, early on in the first book. He comes back and, uh, you know, he sees that the farm got destroyed and his uncle's dead and his cousin's gone. What the heck? Well, now that uh, the Empire knows who Aragorn is and, uh, you know, which valley he came from, they're sending forces to uh, to come do some interrogations there, and Roran ends up like leading a rebellion. And uh, he says, "We're gonna take the whole valley. We're gonna pick up and leave, and we're gonna go find the Varden because this is just gonna keep getting worse no matter where we go." So Roran becomes pretty freaking cool in this book. He goes from just being like this worker farm boy grunt to like, "Well, I'm pretty good with a claw hammer, and I'll just start killing soldiers with it." So. That was intense. Uh, he plans to marry Katrina, daughter of Sloane, the village butcher. While the village is at peace, they are unexpectedly attacked by Galvatorix's soldiers and the Razak. They're back, jerks. Uh, Roran fights the soldiers with a hammer, which becomes his signature weapon. The Razak and most of the soldiers escape, saying that they want information from Roran. The entire village then sets up defenses, and during a second invasion, the Razak escape again. They're slippery that way. One night, Roran wakes up to find Katrina being attacked by the Razak, who sneaked into the house. They seriously injure him, and they capture Katrina. Sloane is revealed to be in league with the Razak, and is then flown away by them along with Katrina. Uh, 
scumbag. Torn between chasing after Katrina and staying behind to defend his home, Roran rallies almost the entirety of the village to travel to Sorda and join the Varden. On the way, they journey to Tyrm, where Roran meets Jode, Brom's friend, who informs him about Aragon and decides to go with them. Uh, I thought those, this was set up pretty well story-wise, you know, having Roran kind of follow in Aragon's footsteps. And uh, Paolini did that thing where um, subtle and seemingly innocu innocuous things in the first book pay off really well in the second book. And I was like, okay, you know, he, he planned that ahead really well. And, uh, you know, Roran keeps leveling up throughout this book. So I think that was a nice mechanism to kind of change the pace between the, the calmer and quieter moments in Elismira when Aragon was doing his book learning and then, okay, now we'll jaunt over to Roran real quick for some action to wake you up and then we'll go back to Aragon. It, it helped things move along a little bit faster. Uh, Roran meets Jode. With Jode's help, they steal a ship and they journey towards Sorda by sea. Meanwhile, Naswata struggles under the burdens of leadership. She hatches a plan to fund the Varden by selling magically crafted lace to alleviate their financial troubles. Gonna admit, this is a pretty boring part of the story. She also meets Elva, a child supposedly blessed by Aragon in the previous book. Aragon is revealed to have botched the blessing with poor phrasing, that's the whole elven magic language thing, uh, accidentally forcing Elva to feel the pain of the others. I completely forgot about this character until I just read this. Elva uses her abilities to save Naswata from an assassination attempt. Naswata eventually learns that Galbatorix is fielding a massive army against them, and she sends for help from the dwarves and Aragon. Luke Skywalker is in Dagobah, and he gets a vision that his friends are in trouble. Aragon has a prophetic dream of the coming battle and decides to interrupt his training to aid the Varden in battle. Oramus consents and provides him with numerous gifts to help him, but insists that he return to finish his training after the battle. He journeys with Saphira and Oryk to the Varden's camp, reuniting with Naswata and Arya, and meeting Elva, promising to rid her of his failed blessing. The Varden are then joined by an army of Urgals, who seek an alliance with them after being freed of Durza's control. So, much more complex than Orcs, which makes them a bad one-to-one -one comparison. They were originally kind of a cannon fodder, type race in the in the first book, but it was Durza who was using magic to manipulate them and control their minds. That's one of the, like, the really evil things that Galbatorix and his, uh, his acolytes do, uh, is violate the will of sentient beings. And now that the Urgals are freed from that, they say, hey, you know, we, we want some redemption here. We want to fight with you guys against Galbatorix and his forces. As the battle begins, it goes poorly for the massively outnumbered Varden. Roran and the dwarves arrive mid-battle and begin to turn the tide in the favor of the Varden. Very cool scene. But an unknown dragon rider unexpectedly arrives and kills Hrothgar, the dwarf king. Aragorn engages this rider who proves an even match. Yeah, actually he proves to be a superior match. This guy's got all kinds of tricks that Aragorn doesn't know anything about. Also, one thing I'm going to highlight here is that um, as far as like dragon breeds or species or anything like that, it's not that complex at all. Dragons are basically just dragons and they're all defined by being different colors. Uh, Saphira is a blue dragon, Glader is a gold dragon, um, and out of nowhere, Aragorn is suddenly fighting a red dragon. Uh, red dragon and the rider starts kicking his butt. Aragorn unmasks him. Turns out it's Murtog. Murtog reveals that he was kidnapped by the twins, told you they were evil, who had betrayed the Varden. The dragon, whose name is Thorn, hatched for him. They, they took Murtog to Galbatorix. Galbatorix still has a couple of dragon eggs. One of them hatched for him. And they were both forced into loyalty by Galbatorix. He breaks their minds. He does that. Meanwhile, the battle proceeds with the twins revealing themselves and causing massive losses among the Varden until Roran kills them with a hammer. Murtog and Aragorn resume their fight, with Murtog easily defeating Aragorn through magic. Um, one of the other functions of this magic system is that it, it, there are ways of like storing energy and saving it up for later. It's hard to do in big quantities, and once Aragorn gets kind of mildly good at it, you can even like borrow life from things around you, but there are still limits to it. And even when he's gotten to a point where he's decently good at it, um, Murtog just whoops him. Like, he's got advantages that Aragorn doesn't know about. He just, he just overwhelms him, overpowers him. 
Um, they resume their fight. Murtaugh easily defeats Aragorn through magic. He shows mercy to him on account of their old friendship. There was also a logic trick in this, which is why it was important for Aragorn to use logic. As part of Galbatorix breaking Murtaugh's mind, he also used the magic language to like, you know, give him an order and elicit an oath from him. And Aragorn found like a logical loophole in the oath. He said, he's like, you can go back, which you're compelled to do, and you can tell him that you did X, Y, Z, which is technically what you just did to me, but you don't have to kill me or take my stuff. And Murtaugh's like, cool, because I don't want to kill you and take your stuff, but I have to do what I'm magically compelled to do. He does take Aragorn's sword, though, Zarok, which uh, isn't just some regular sword. It's a magical sword. It's red. It, was, it belonged to, uh, to Murtaugh's father. So, you know, Darth Vader's lightsaber, we'll say. Although, uh, again, Murtog is not a one-to-one -one comparison to any particular Star Wars character. If anything, he's a lot more like Bucky from Avengers. You know, he's, he's the Winter Soldier. His mind was controlled. He was forced to do evil things. He was buddies with the main character. You see how it goes. But he takes the sword, and uh, he pisses off back to Galvatorix. He claims that the sword was my inheritance. Boom! Dropped the name of the series right there. Uh, and he also reveals that uh, he and Aragon are brothers. This was... This was a bit of a messy line because it got to be um, retconned in book three. So I, I don't focus on that element of it so much. But supposedly they had the same mother or something. I, it, was, it was weird. I don't know. Uh, ultimately, the Varden win the battle. The book ends as Roran asks Aragon for help in rescuing Katrina, to which he agrees. Because, hey, cousins, right? So... Uh, Eldest was a lot heavier on action than Aragon, and uh, it was a little bit denser of a book in parts, but still a very compelling read. Um, I had the deluxe hardcover of Aragon, and then like the limited edition hardcover of Eldest. Uh, there was a fan theory at the time that the third book would keep the naming convention of the first two, where it would be a six-letter word that started with E, and so you, you know, it was going to be Empire. You'd have Aragon, Eldest, and Empire. Obviously, Paolini didn't go that route. It wasn't something that he wanted to do. I guess he wasn't you know, necessarily married to that format. But as he was working on the third book, uh, it got too long. He ended up splitting it in, into two. And uh, if Eldest came out in 06, Brisinger came out in 08, and then it was another three years before Inheritance came out. So there was some time in between. I've had that happen myself. I'm looking over at my bookshelf. I've got a trilogy where... The third book is literally twice as long as the first book, even though I had envisioned the entire trilogy being, you know, three books of the same length. But, you know, that third book, it wouldn't have worked if I'd split it in two. Whereas, you know, Paolini with high fantasy, you can kind of get away with that, that slow plotting thing. As long as each individual book has its own arc, I suppose that can work. Um, but I do remember when the third book came along, I read it and... Some of, my, some of my zeal for it had gone out at that point. I felt like it was a little bit more of a chore to finish. I think his focus got a little bit more scattered, but he still obviously had success with it. Uh, I just felt like I had kind of outgrown it at that point, but we'll talk about that when we get into it in just a moment. All right, book three, Brisinger. That's one of the magical words in the elven language. That's the word for fire. It's significant because it was the first magical word that Aragon uttered. Uh, if I remember right, I don't think he really meant to. It just kind of came to him in the moment, and uh, it, was a, it was a cool scene from the first book. Uh, Aragon, Saphira, and Roran travel to Helgrind, or possibly Helgrind, the home of the Razak. There they rescue Roran's betrothed, Katrina. And uh, they kill one of the Razaks. Saphira, Roran, and Katrina return to the Varden while Aragorn stays behind. He kills the other Razak, who warns him that Galbatorix has discovered the name. Unclear as to what that is, but in the same way that uh, elven magical words are the exact real thing that they are, and you can use them to have magic over other things, if you know somebody's like true magical name, you can have power over them. That's one of Galbatorix's greatest strengths is breaking minds and learning people's names, which is why he's able to violate so many people's will. Um, but yeah, he, he knows some dangerous name and that makes him an even greater threat to Aragon in particular. Aragon finds and condemns Sloane, Katrina's treacherous father, to uh, never meet his daughter again and arranges for him to travel to Elismira, the elven homeland. 
Aragon then travels back to the Varden after reuniting with Arya, who had come in search of him. Once they return to the Varden, uh, Aragon discovers that Katrina is pregnant with Roran's child and a wedding is arranged. Oh my, they did a naughty. Uh, which Aragon is to conduct. Just before it begins, a small force of troops attack alongside Murtog and his dragon, Thorn. Scumbag, you broke up the wedding. The soldiers had spells cast on them that removed their ability to feel pain. It's called PCP, making them better fighters. Uh, Elven spellcasters aid Aragon and Saphira and cause Murtog and Thorn to flee, winning the battle. After the fight, Roran marries Katrina. Okay, so a bit of a, a wedding crasher party going right there, but still got the job done. Uh, the leader of the Varden, Naswada, orders Aragon to attend the election of the new Dwarf King in the Beor Mountains, while Saphira stays behind to protect the Varden. This is one of the things that made this story slow down for me. Let's get into some dwarf politics. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, Aragon is to support the bid of Auric, the former king's adoptive son who favors the Varden. Aragon heads to Farthendur where the election takes place. Once there, Aragon is the target of an assassination attempt perpetrated by a rider hating dwarf clan who don't take kindly to your kind around here. Auric forces them into exile. Having earned the sympathies of the dwarves, Auric is elected the new king. Saphira journeys to Farthendur for Oryx's coronation and repairs is a giant red sapphire thing that got destroyed in the first book. I'm not going to try to figure out how to say that name. The previously destroyed Star Rose. She uses magic to put it back together. After Oryx's coronation, Aragon and Saphira journey to Elismira to learn the secret of Galbatorix's power. There, they learn that Aragon's deceased mentor, Brom, was Aragon's father. Obi-Wan was Luke's dad, not Anakin. Like I say, it, there's a bit of a confusing retcon there. Glader also reveals the source of Galbatorix's power. It's called Eldunari, a dragon organ, which allows its holder to communicate with and draw energy from the dragon it belongs to, even if the dragon is deceased. It's like a, a gem heart organ thing inside them. Um, you know, a, a dragon can pull it out of himself while he's still alive and give it to his rider. And then like, even if the dragon dies, that's fine. You've still got this like nuclear reactor of dragon magic that you can just kind of carry around forever and it keeps the dragon's soul attached to it. A lot of ramifications for that. Uh, the Eldunari. Um, Galbatorix spent years collecting Eldunari, drawing his power from the dragons he slew. So one of these would be pretty intense. He's got multiple. That's bad. After some training, Aragon visits Runan, the elven blacksmith who used to forge swords for riders. She refuses to forge Aragon a new sword because she swore to never create a weapon again, having depleted her stocks of the required metal. It was something special. But the werecat Solenbaum pops up and gives uh, some instructions. Aragon acquires the metal from under the roots of the Manoa tree. There's a meteor that landed there forever ago. Aragon is able to find it with magic, dig it up. Runon forges him a sword by controlling Aragon's body using puppet magic and stuff. He names the sword Brisinger, which causes it to burst in flames whenever its name is said aloud. Pretty cool. Now he's got his own lightsaber. Oramis and Glader decide to join the battle against the Empire alongside Islan Zadi. She's the queen of the elves. So even though they're crippled, the uh, the elf dragon rider and his big old one-armed dragon, three-legged three dragon, whatever, they're rolling up. Uh, to prevent Galbatorix from claiming his Eldunari should he fall in combat and continue guiding Aragon, Glader gives his Eldunari to Aragon. Glader and Oramis fly to Gilead, while Aragon and Saphira fly to Feinster, a city sieged by the Varden. Being the kind of fantasy book that this is, there's a huge map inside the front cover, and uh, you'll find yourself flipping back to it and referring to it several times throughout the story. It's fine, it's cool, it was one of the things that I enjoyed about it. Meanwhile, Roran is sent on various missions as a soldier of the Varden to beat people to death with a hammer, a man after my own heart. One mission against soldiers that can't feel pain results in many casualties, and in Roran being assigned to an incompetent commander. During another mission, this commander almost causes the entire force to be decimated. This is not the fault of Paolini, this is the fault of whoever wrote this summary. Decimated means you lose a tenth of your force, which is significant, but it's not a synonym for annihilation. Speak Latin, all right? 
decimation. Roran takes charge of a small group of soldiers loyal to him and leads them to victory against overwhelming odds. Despite this, Roran is charged with insubordination and is flogged as punishment. Now I'm doubting myself on decimation. Does it mean a tenth is destroyed or only a tenth remains? If that case, yeah, then it would be similar enough for our needs. I don't know. It's 2.30 in the morning. Don't care. Afterwards, Nasuata promotes Roran to commander and sends his unit on a mission with both men and Urgols to enforce the idea of men and Urgols working together. When an Urgol named <laughs> Yarbog arg, challenges Roran for leadership of the unit, he wrestles him into submission. We do things different in the farm. Uh, after returning to the Varden, his squad joins the siege of Finster Feinster. As the siege begins, Aragon rescues Arya, she still won't make out with him, and departs to find the leader of the city, but discovers three magicians attempting to create a shade. While attempting to kill the magicians, Aragon has a vision through Glader's Eldunari, showing him and Oramus fighting Murtog and Thorn in the sky. During the fight, Galbatorix takes control of Murtog and tries to lure Oramus to his side. Failing to do so, he slays Oramus as he suffers a seizure, which... Uh, is apparently a, a side effect of the magical injuries that some of these writers endure. Glader, in grief, is also killed. After the vision, the magicians succeed in creating the shade Valrog. Aragon and Arya fight and slay Valrog, so, ah, he spawns, and he's dead like three seconds later, with Arya dealing the fatal blow. After the successful siege, Aragon resolves to continue the fight against the Empire to avenge Oramis and Glader. I've had problems with series like this before where, um, you know, the, the writer obviously wants to keep writing things set in the world. So we get another book in the series and by the end of it, you're really not all that differently off than you were at the beginning. Um, I had this problem recently with uh, Lightbringer from the Red Rising series. Uh, it was a very long and protracted literary campaign and at the end, main character was just about where they were at the beginning. Uh, I understand that there's still an audience for that kind of book. I'm just not in it. So nothing against you if that's your thing. For me, I, I like a story to accomplish something, maybe even something significant. It is fun spending time in worlds like this. And there are worlds where I enjoy spending time that other readers might not. But for me personally, that's kind of what made it fizzle out for me. Um, and that's what made my interest wane that and the fact that I got married and I was into other stuff when the first or the fourth book came out. So yeah, that's, uh, that thing slowed it down for me. But overall, uh, it still had a lot of good going for it. I just remember getting to the end and thinking like, he didn't have to split this into two books, he could have just trimmed it. But he's sitting on a mountain of cash and I'm still working 60 hours a week for a living. So really, who won that argument? Book four, Inheritance, here we are. Book one had Saphira on the cover, two had Thorn, three had Glader, and uh, the fourth one has a green dragon. All right, here we go. The Varden, the Rebellion, they're attacking the Death Star. The Empire City of Bellatona. In the battle, Saphira is nearly killed by a Douth Dart. It's very similar to a German word, it sounds like, for death dart. A spear from the Dragon Wars that can bypass magical wards and kill dragons. Bellatona is captured by the Varden, and an alliance is later formed between the Varden and the Werecats. We're making alliances with all kinds of sentient species around here. Werecats actually can t transform into you know, bipedal humanoid forms. I remember there being a debate at the beginning of this book where... Uh, the werecats wanted two sets of armor, one for their human form and one for their cat form. And Naswata's like, we're kind of scant on resources. Like, you got to pick one, all right? Whichever one you want to fight in, that's what we'll make. But other than that, stack up and shut up. Afterwards, Aragon's cousin Roran is sent on a mission to capture the Arufs, which he succeeds at using unconventional tactics. I don't know what the Arufs were. Roran rejoins the Varden at Dras Leona which proves difficult to take as it is under protection by Murtog and his dragon, Thorn. Jode, the guy from that city, finds information about a possible entrance to the city via an incomplete sewer system under it. Aragon, Arya, Angela, the witch, the werecat Solombum, and an elf named Worden. Do I smell a red shirt? 
Enter the sewer system to sneak into the city and open the gates. However, the mission goes awry as the tunnels are used by the priests of Hellgrind. Oh no! Who separate the group, slay Worden, called it, and capture Aragon and Arya. The priests worship the Razak and attempt to feed Aragon and Arya to Razak hatchlings, although Angela and Solombum save them. Aragon is then able to open the city gates and defeat Murtog and Thorn, allowing the Varden to take the city. As Aragon and Arya become drunk to celebrate their victory, wonder what's going to happen, Murtog and Thorn attack their camp, dadgummit, and capture Naswata. In their absence, er, in her absence, Aragon is appointed as the leader of the Varden as they march on to Urubain, the capital of the Empire. We are going to Mordor, boys. Aragon struggles under the weight of command. Oh, gosh, this job is hard, and it sucks. And he recalls Solombum's previous advice, instructing him to journey to the Rock of Kuthian to open the Vault of Souls. What? As nobody has knowledge of the rock, he questions Solombum, discovering that he had given the advice on instinct. Some random magical memory triggered in him. Hey, go do this thing at the place and find the object and stuff will happen. During the conversation, Solombum appears to be possessed, helping Aragon discover that the rock is located on Vrainguard Island and protected by magic, which causes everyone, barring himself and Sephira, to forget about it upon hearing of it. Kind of a cool mechanism. We've seen that used in other pieces of fiction. Uh, I don't have the map to hand right in front of me, but if I remember right, Vrainguard Island was on the western side of it, and uh, or maybe there was a different, maybe Doru Reva. I don't know. I'm already remembering this stuff all differently. There was one island that had a bunch of shattered dragon eggshells on it, but uh, the Vault of Souls was something else. Anyway, uh, he informs Arya and Glader of this. Uh, Glader, because remember, he's still got the, the rock that's got Glader's consciousness in it. Glader is dead, but uh, Aragorn has the Eldunari. Uh, he informs Arya and Glader of this and decides to journey to Vrainguard with Saphira. Glader joins them with Arya staying behind to maintain the illusion that Aragorn has not left. That and um, she did get drunk with him. It got weird. On the island, Aragon and Saphira find the rock and learn uh, that they must speak their true names to enter the Vault of Souls. Eventually, they find their true names and gain entry. Don't want to drag that out too long. Inside, they find a horde of Eldenary and Dragon Eggs. Sweet! We've got our own nuclear reactors to go up against uh, Galvatorix. Um, they, uh, hidden before Galvatorix destroyed the riders. That's important. Umaroth, the dragon who leads the Eldenari. So, you know, if I remember right, like, there wasn't an actual physical dragon. It was just, you know, like I said, each of them has a dragon consciousness inside. Decides to join Aragon to overthrow Galvatorix. They journey to Urubain under siege by the combined forces of the Varden, Elves, Werecats, Urgles, and Dwarves. Aragon, Aragorn, Ghost Army, Ghost Dragon Army. It, it's fine, it works. Aragorn reveals the Eldenari to the army's leaders and they plan their attack. They com their combined forces attack Urubain while Aragorn, Saphira, Ara, Arya, Elva, the little girl that Aragorn blessed and screwed up, and elven spellcasters break into Galbatorix's citadel. After overcoming a series of traps and being separated from the spellcasters, they reach the throne room. Exactly as I had foreseen. There, Galbatorix easily subdues them and reveals that he has learned the true name of the ancient language itself, referred to as the word. Geez, if you know the name of the language, then you can control the language, and everybody who uses that language is screwed. Uh, negating any spoken spells against him. To amuse himself, he orders Murtog and Aragon to fight using only their swords. Blue lightsaber, red lightsaber. Hmm. Aragorn defeats Murtog and urges him to join his side. Murtog, who had developed feelings for Nasawada in her captivity. <laughs> what? That came out of nowhere. Uh, has his true name changed, which can happen when you fall in love, I guess. And he turns on Galbatorix, using the word to strip him of his wards. Galbatorix incapacitates Murtog and uh, battles Ar Aragorn while Saphira and Thorn battle his dragon, Shruikon. With the Elden Ari, Aragorn casts a spell to make Galbatorix experience the pain and suffering that he had caused. Galbatorix went hardcore right-wing influencer bro and turned off his emotions. Aragorn found the switch, flipped it back to the on position, and suddenly Galbatorix has a very big sad. 
Arya kills Shruikon with the Douth Dart, the dragon dart thingy. Overwhelmed with guilt, Galbatorix uses magic to destroy himself and most of the Citadel, although Aragorn is able to protect those in it. To heal from their ordeal, Murtog and Thorne decide to journey far away, teaching Aragorn the word before departing. He's like, hey, this super powerful thing, you can have it. I don't want it, I don't need it. Nazwada becomes the High Queen of Alagesia, and King Orin of Surda grudgingly pleases his allegiance to... Pleases, pledges his allegiance to her. Arya returns to Elismira to help choose a new queen for the elves. Spoiler alert, it's her. Uh, her mom died. She takes the remaining dragon egg that Galbatorix had. It hatches for her. She names the dragon Fearnan, Green Dragon. Aragorn realizes that there is no safe place to raise the dragons and train new riders in Alagasia. He thus decides to sail away with the Elden Ree and the eggs to a re region far east of Alagasia. Aragorn reworks the magic of the pact between riders and dragons to allow dwarves and urgals to become riders. That was a sticking point with those anti-rider dwarves before because only humans could become dragon riders. Uh, humans and elves. Uh, dwarves and urgals could, or uh, can now too. He leaves two eggs for each of the races. The future riders will travel to Aragon for training while eggs will be periodically sent back to Alagasia. Aragorn and Saphira sadly say their farewells to their friends and family, but look forward to the future. Aragorn does not get the girl, and he leaves Alagasia and doesn't come back, so far as we know. So where does that leave us going into this new fifth book? Well, you know, if, if Murtog fell in love with Nasawada, then you know, there's a potential you know, love interest there. We might get a glimpse of these dwarf and urgal dwar uh, dragon riders. I don't know if it's going to be... 12 years in the future, or if it's going to be immediately after. I feel like that was something that was mentioned in the description of the book, but it's not coming to mind now. But as you can see, like there's a lot to recommend it, a lot to kind of sink your teeth into. And I think that having a, like a, a darker, kind of more hard-edged version of the Aragon character, which is kind of what Murtaugh did, and, you know, one who had to walk a more broken and bumpy path and is trying to find his way back, you know, see seeking redemption. I like characters that go through that kind of arc. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed reading about characters that, uh, that do that, that are working their way through that. And, you know, if he's got kind of the whole world against him and he's trying to prove that he is worth their camaraderie and their fellowship and even their admiration, then those are noble things to work towards. So, um, Reading through these summaries and, and remembering what I loved about those earlier books and, and, uh, and all that, it's gotten me excited to get back into that world. So let me know what some of your favorite stuff was about it, what you liked. As for the rest, like, share, subscribe, you know the deal. Talk to you guys soon. Once I get uh, Murtaugh read, I'll do a review of it here, of course. Till next time, drive safe. See you out there.